TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch, we are live, we are live. So you can uh, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. You probably won't catch this live, so go to twitch.com. Username at the bottom of the screen if you want to watch any previous lives or or catch one in the future. Don't forget we got Patreon and we also got merch. All of that is located in the description below. Uh, right above me, this is a warning. I don't know what this video holds, but I'm going to just put that there. This is the mysterious unaliving of M16 agent Gareth Williams. Talk to me. Copyright disclaimer under section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. 2010, a busy year of memorable worldwide events. At home, Prince William gets engaged. He's a true romantic. The Conservative Party unites with the Liberal Democrats to form a coalition government. Apple released the first generation of the iPad, heralding a new dawn in technology. Three lion. Do anybody use Apple iPods? I mean, uh, iPads? I feel like only children use them. Torn apart by the children. At the World Cup, Germany sent England home. Lampards disallowed goal added to the... But in Russia, a darker, deadly atmosphere pervades. I have no doubt that this was an attempt to kill. Journalists, businessmen, human rights activists are found shot, strangled, Jasper. poisoned, murdered. Quite a few of Putin's enemies have perished by swallowing things they shouldn't have. The killings weren't limited to Moscow. The death of a jogger in this exclusive Surrey neighborhood is officially unexplained. The secret intelligence service was awakening to a new era of Cold War espionage. In 2006, the murder of Litvinenko in London confirmed there were no borders or barriers I have a documentary about this guy. Hold on, look. It's been in my watch later for a legitimately a year. Here it is, right here. At the top. Like, this has been here for at least two years. I never watched it. Maybe I should watch that now. To the Kremlin's dark arts. But I cannot think of a, another capital globally that really represents the center of espionage more than London itself. And that was an interesting experience being an MI6 officer because I would deploy as much trade craft simply going across London as I would do in any other city in the world. The world of espionage. What is going on? Is this the intro? Was the battleground. This was the deadly environment that Gareth was promoted to in 2010. Just months later, he was dead. But who was the spy in the bag? Gareth Williams was a highly talented mathematician. I think probably fair to call him a genius. Uh, Gareth Williams was uh, regarded as uh, highly proficient and uh, a very effective member of the security organisation for which he worked. He was based normally at GCHQ in Cheltenham, but was on uh, short-term transfer to MI6. MI6 is the elite institution of the British Intelligence Service, and it's always looking to recruit the best minds in the country. Gareth passed his GCSEs aged 10, A-levels by 13, and his first degree by 17. His extraordinary mind was evident from a very early age. I've never come across anybody who had that ability at all. He was, he was way above anything that I've ever seen. We had people who went to Oxford and Cambridge, but this was something totally different. He was way above anything I couldn't imagine, to be quite honest. I'm also a genius, so I understand how Gareth was coming. 
I just want to throw that out there. But not not a genius in in his realm. I'm a genius in my own. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Not in my own mind, but in my own realm. He wasn't a social child, if you understand what I mean. He was definitely happier when he was sitting in front of a computer, there's no doubt about it. He was just totally on his own, and the computer was his friend. It's that simple. The beating heart of GCHQ are its mathematicians. They are the code breakers, the direct descendants of the people who shortened the Second World War by a number of years by breaking German codes oh, in Bletchley yeah. Park. So how did this brilliant 31-year-old MI6 operative meet such a chilling end? What happened? What happened? One day in August 2010, the police received a call from the government communications headquarters, the hub of the UK intelligence service, better known as GCHQ. It was a... This is in the UK? For some reason, I just never... Why UK have I intelligence never... service, better known as GCHQ. It was a phone call that would lead to one of Britain's biggest unsolved mysteries. I wanted to report one of our members, staff, who lives and works in London as missing. Detective Sergeant Paul Colgan was first to respond. There was certainly nothing within the message to suggest that this was anything more than knock on the door to see who was there, if they were okay, and then report back. It was in a quiet residential road, an old Victorian building. This revealing footage gave an insight into Gareth's lifestyle and the contents of his flat. This was Gareth's crew? Going into the flat, it was immaculate. It's empty. There wasn't a thing out of place. I remember there were laptops, certainly computers in there. A couple of mobile phones I do remember being on the table. There was a number of North Face bags piled up. And I remember there was a couple of wigs on the side. The bedroom again was tidy. There was certainly nothing to suggest there'd been a struggle or, or any form of crime had taken place at that point. I'm walking into the bathroom, nothing to suggest anything happened. The only strange thing was the bag in the bath. It was secured with a padlock through two zippers meeting in the middle. When I picked it up, was it was heavy? heavy, but not inordinately heavy in, in that I could lift it myself without helping anybody else. So it was heavy, but not body heavy. But because of the odour that was coming from it and the fluid that was leaking from it, I decided that it had to be cut open. I decided to cut down the side of it near the zipper, but not on the padlock itself in order to preserve as much forensics as possible. DNA. On cutting through the bag, the, uh, the, uh, I was met by an overpowering stench of, uh, of um, decomposing flesh. It's something you never forget. The first thing I saw was a nose, I then opened the bag a little bit further, and then there was a, uh, the, the, the face of a body, it had clearly been dead for some time, frothing at the mouth and nose. That was the point I decided that this was a crime scene and we would leave the premises, secure them and then call in the murder teams to take over. There's been a huge amount of police activity and people in forensic outfits, all a bit grim really. Good gracious me, how a man can be obviously murdered in his flat there is awful, that doesn't normally happen. Now being treated as a suspect. And this is unsolved, right? Vicious death. Yeah, unsolved. Forensics teams were called to the flat to start looking for any potential evidence. I think, obviously, that you always feel very saddened by the scene in front of you. You can't help that. I think you wouldn't be human if you didn't. But the great thing that I found is that you become so overwhelmed almost immediately with the need to start doing something really meaningful and it's really important that you get going as quickly as possible. You don't have much time to dwell on the emotional, the obvious emotional aspects of, the, of what's in front of you. 
Let's get to the nitty. The investigation would be overseen by Detective Chief Superintendent Hamish Campbell. My initial thoughts were like many others. It, it was certainly bizarre and rare. And in ordinary circumstances, the discovery of a naked person inside Hamish a locked Campbell. bag in the Rome premises almost invariably would result in immediate identification of murder. When you're looking at homicide, you have to have some theories to it. And in this case, Gareth's death had an, only three options primarily. Okay. Either his death was a single event by himself and no one else involved. The second scenario... I don't even think that was an option. He was zipped and locked in a bag. So that could, that, that, that ain't it. Mario was that his death was the result of another person or persons involved in him being placed in that bag. And the third possibility is again that other person or persons were involved and it was murder. And that Gareth was therefore deliberately killed and placed in the bag. Okay. I'm feeling like it's option three. The forensics teams had to follow a strict process to ensure any clues that could solve the mystery weren't missed. The principles that are followed are control, preserve, record, recover. So you get control of the crime scene, you preserve the evidence, uh, make sure it's not interfered with in any way. Uh, then try and establish who is inside the bag, what condition the body is in, and gradually start working towards what is the evidence that's available that might explain how, how this body got in the bag and how they, how they died. If you look at this crime scene, even as a, a specialist who attends the scene, it, it's very likely that you will never have encountered anything like this before. If you then link that to Garrett's background, and all the issues that that might bring someone who is employed by GCHQ and currently working with MI6, it brings an even more extraordinary dimension to it. It does. This could be like a movie. Whilst forensic evidence was being collected, the content of Gareth's flat had already been leaked to the press, and the mystery was deepening. 20,000 pounds worth of women's clothes were found, along with wigs, mobile phones, one restored to factory settings, one with a search history that included bondage sites. Gareth. The mixture of spying and sex quickly reduced Gareth's lifestyle to a perverse, headline-grabbing version of the truth. The public was fascinated by the case and television news bulletins were all too happy to broadcast the salate. Am I considered media? Because literally, that's exactly the thought that came to my head was this. This part in particular. Was he doing that? Did by the case, and television news bulletins were all too happy to broadcast the salacious details of his death. He'd visited bondage websites, gone to gay bars and bought tickets to drag shows. Police have revealed new details about the intensely private life of MI6 spy Gareth Williams, who was found dead in his London flat in August. Of course, he had a flat. He had tens of thousands of pounds of women's clothing in this flat. He was interested in women's fashion. He'd been portrayed as a cross-dresser, which there was no evidence that he was. And Even if it was, so what? Whatever that man do in his private time is what he do in his free time. And so what? Exactly. You know, that's, that was Gareth, and he should, have been he should be allowed that space to be who he was, right. not be portrayed as some kind of geek, cross-dresser, kind of demi-spy. That, that simply... Yeah, it doesn't even matter what he do in his free time. Like, but at the end of the day, he was smarter than 99% of the population. And that's going to always be a, a flex, you know what I'm saying? He doesn't represent him as an individual. This grisly discovery quickly moved from a standard welfare check to an international headline-grabbing story. A story that involved a dead spy locked naked in a duffel bag whose name was already being smeared in the press. Rumours started to circulate 
that shadowy forces were involved. Maybe he was the first casualty of what I called a new Cold War with Russia. He didn't deserve to die in the course of his duty. He certainly didn't deserve to be rubbished and to be smeared in a way that subsequently happened. It was murder. Yeah, I don't think that the, his private life had anything to do with it. See, this is why I don't really be watching the news and stuff like that, because they'll take something that's irrelevant and bring it to the front like it has some type of relevance on anything that happened. Like, and it was murder by people who knew exactly how to do it without leaving a, a trace. trace. August 2010. Police had been called to an address in Pimlico, West London. It's a straightforward welfare check on a 31-year-old male. But this was no ordinary man. This was a brilliant codebreaker. So this all started from a welfare check, okay. Part of the elite spy network responsible for preventing atrocities, That's why. Okay. espionage, oh, the lady had and terrorism. Okay. Gareth Williams' body was found naked, decomposing, and in a bag padlocked from the outside. With very little evidence to go on, the case was getting more complex by the second. To have any hope of unraveling this extraordinary mystery, investigators needed to build a profile of Gareth. The first clue came from his childhood in rural Wales. He loved the problem, he loved solving it, especially if it was a sort of problem, anything to do with computing or anything in the digital world. To give you an example, I was asked to write a programme which would deal with staff absences in the school, but I was stuck on one thing, I couldn't get it to work. And I said, Gareth, have a look at that for me. And he, he got hold of it and he had a look and he went through it and he said, in Welsh, he said, Mr Thomas, this is inelegant. And so he <laughs> had to look at it and he... he... <laughs> ah, Gareth, not in... What did he say? Mr Thomas, this is inelegant. Inelegant? I'm sorry, like, this is a serious matter that we watch it, but inelegant? Do people say that? I'm going to start saying that. Yo, oh, yeah. Turn me up. Don't ever disrespect me, because it's inelegant. And so uh, he had to look at it, and he, like he it. brought a little routine that dealt with it supremely. That was the kind of thing he loved. Inelegant. He wasn't a social child, if you understand what I mean. I'm not aware that he had any friends as such. Uh, he didn't have any friends in the sense that he had a best friend or that he had somebody he went out with. He, he was just totally on his own and the computer was his friend. It's that simple. When he was separated from the computer and was asked to go out, quite often I've seen him sort of just walking up and down outside the computer room waiting to be let in like a lost sheep. I'm not gonna lie, he was and definitely I mean this in the most, no, I'm, I'm being serious. It sounds like Gareth is on the spectrum. Like, uh, you know, because any of y'all are not familiar, autism shows up in many different forms and ways. Like, it sounds like he had, shout out to Pino 1983 for the sub. Sounds like he was on, on the spectrum now, with Prime too. Pierre, when he was sitting in front of a computer, there's no doubt about it. Although not medically trained and going on his own interactions with Gareth, Nigel believes he may have been on the autistic spectrum. Ah! Uh, listen. Told y'all I'm a genius. What I know of autism, and I think that Gareth was slightly on the autistic spectrum, is that it is difficult to interact with other people. It's difficult to understand what the emotions, it's, under, it's difficult to... I low-key think, like, now in my adult years, because it's very difficult for me to understand people's emotions, and I'll be looking at people like... I'd really be thinking, like, maybe I should go check. Like, on some real stuff, like, real, like, re reality. I'm not playing. I'm being very 100% serious. Know what to do in a certain situation. Uh, I, I know that it's difficult for people with autism to have relationships because they have to renew the relationship every time they meet that person. It's a very, very difficult thing to say. By the time Gareth had graduated from university and started a second degree at Cambridge, his talents had been noticed by the security services and a job was offered at GCHQ. His work involved developing software 
analyzing patterns of communication and cracking terrorist activities. He was surrounded by like-minded people, fitted in very well, and excelled at his work. You need extremely brave people. You need people who can drink two bottles of wine at lunch and walk home. But you also need people with completely different skill sets. And as the world digitizes itself, those people who really understand what it all means and how to make it work, they are um, the jewels in the crown. The computer people are the beating heart of GCHQ, physically located. They're the beating heart of anything. It at the center of the donor. By 2010, now Gareth had been seconded to MI6, the elite section of the Secret Intelligence Service, and a very different working environment. The mathematicians and coders had been replaced by elite spies who risked their lives on a daily basis. MI6 would always fairly or unfairly categorize people who worked in GCHQ as, as typically very introverted, certainly not very sociable, um, not comfortable in large groups. Um, uh. I feel like a lot of people in the tech industry are like that. When I used to work at Discover HQ, they had an IT department, of course, because it was a credit card. They had to have all that coding. And a lot of them, they were they were able to talk to each other because they had common ground. But take them out of that situation and you was... They was froze. And certainly not outgoing personality types. Um, by contrast, in MI6, um, the organization is looking very much for gregarious type individuals, people who can hold their own in social situations and indeed can bend with the wind according to the situation they're in. By all accounts, Gareth's ability to interpret code was extraordinary. But if, as some have suggested, he may have been neurodivergent, this new world of espionage he now found himself in could have been extremely challenging. A neurodivergent person is a person that, uh, what we would traditionally call on the spectrum. Alejandra Samarmiento, complex trauma and psychosexual specialist. Possibly autistic. That would have impacted him on his everyday life. His sense of the world, the people around him, his work, his challenges would have been very different to yours or mine. Really, to become a spy, you literally need to be able to read the room. You need to be able to change tact very quickly. And for somebody that is neurodivergent and is used to working with computers, numbers, patterns, that's a very different skill set and perhaps would have been a lot more challenging that Gareth may have anticipated himself. I can do that, though. Just weeks after starting at MI6, Gareth requested a transfer back to GCHQ in Cheltenham. At the same time... So this is London. London kind of looked like a bit of New York. Because all this digital screens and things of that nature. At the same time, something dangerous was happening in Britain. Money was pouring in from Russia, with a super-rich elite community arriving, keen to hide their wealth and escape the tyranny uh, of the Kremlin, a tyranny that simply moved to London with them. At the time, in 2010, we had a new coalition government, of which I was a part. David Cameron and George Osborne, who were the main protagonists in that government, uh, were keen to improve relations with Russia. George Osborne was keen to attract Russian money into London, which he saw as advantageous to the city. To attract wealthy foreign investors to the country, the government had launched the so-called Golden Visa Scheme. Applicants had to provide a minimum investment of two million pounds in exchange for the right to live in Britain. Jesus Christ, wait, go back, the Golden Visa? The government had launched the so-called Golden Visa Scheme. Applicants had to provide a minimum investment of two million pounds in exchange for the right to live in Britain. I bet you they was doing it. We saw an increase in Russian money coming into London, belonging to Russian oligarchs. What followed the money were individuals and organizations of fairly dubious character. And as a consequence of that, a blind eye, in my view, was turned to a range of 
assassinations which took place, largely of Russian nationals in London, on the basis that it was inconvenient to draw attention to that and to find the Russian state guilty of assassinations. It's also worth bearing in mind in 2006, Vladimir Putin enabled a new law to be adopted in Russia, which gave license, authority, for uh, assassinations to take place abroad uh, if there were assassinations of people who were harmful to the Russian state. That's insane. That d- Good Garrett's. And I don't want to say too much on them over there, but that's, in- that's crazy. Death be linked to Russia. This is, ru- this is Russia? Why it look like the Willy Wonka factory? What's, this is, I'm not gonna lie, this is, this is nice. Looking. I mean, it's cool. It look cool. Over a 10 year period, 14 people with connections to Russia, many of them former spies. What's this? Oh my God, you could really tell I never paid attention in high school. I ain't never seen none of this. Eyes died in suspicious circumstances. Connections to Russia, many of them former spies, died in suspicious circumstances on British soil. You've got Alexander Perenlichne, who blew the whistle on massive Kremlin fraud. He dropped dead while he was out jogging. Mr. Perenlichne was not just another man out jogging. He was a whistleblower who was instrumental in trying to expose a Russian scandal that stretches around the world. You've got Matthew Puncher, who helped pin Litvinenko's poisoning on Putin. He was stabbed to death with two knives. Litvinenko himself, who defected from the Russian security services, who was poisoned with radioactive polonium in his tea. Boris Berezovsky, who uh, financed international opposition to Putin. He was found hanging from a shower rail in his home. Officially, Thames Valley Police are treating the death as unexplained, but there is no shortage of conspiracy theories surrounding it. But a close family friend told Sky News he was not a man who would take his own life. You've got Alex Chapman revealed sex secrets of his Russian spy wife, Anna, found dead from massive drugs overdose. You've got Scott Young, who interfered in Russian finance, not to Putin's liking, who allegedly committed suicide by throwing himself out of a window. And found himself that man Putin is a gets a demon. God, love impaled on railings. Did he fall or was he pushed? He's one of half a dozen apparently healthy British men, associates of rich Russian exiles, to die here. The list is really quite long, and what it demonstrates, I think, is that over the years the police in this country have been quite happy to conclude suicide in the most unlikely circumstances. The tactic of Russia of late, certainly within the last. 10 plus years has very deliberately been to take a far more brutish approach to um, espionage. It's in many cases not espionage as we know it. It's, it is crass direct action, um, assassinations or attacks or sabotage or whatever. And that is a deliberate tactic driven from the very top by Putin to send messages um, to the Russian populace and that message being loud and clear that look if Don't you do similar me. this is what will happen to you so it's all about Putin controlling what he perceives to be his Russian empire my experience of operating um, in a MI6 was a, a, a new world a, a far more complex I ain't gonna lie the mafia any t- level of gangsterism don't got nothing on what I'm seeing right now this is insane well far more dangerous uh, as a spy being in London it felt as hostile as anywhere else in the world um, because of the activities that were taking place there The bottom line is that we dropped our guard against Putin's Russia. We dropped our guard, and that is a cause of huge national shame, and it should be rightly so. Please don't forget, where does Putin come from? He comes with the KGB. And it was blindingly obvious that somebody like Putin as president would be big, big trouble in intelligence and security terms of this country. Was Gareth Williams discovering some uncomfortable truths? behind Russia's influence in Britain. Maybe that is what Gareth Williams was charged to find out. 
what were they really trying to do in the United Kingdom? What were they really after? What did it really tell us about what was going on in the, in the Kremlin? And maybe, you know, he, he was the first casualty of what I called a new Cold War with Russia. Putin puts a high... So, bro won't smoke with any and everybody that even look his way wrong. ...value on counterintelligence and a low value on those that get in his way. How likely is it that Gareth would become a target for assassination? The assassinations conducted either by a hostile intelligence agency or even by terror cells, um, they do take a lot of planning, um, a lot of forethought. This is speculation, but if Gareth had stumbled across something that potentially compromise what we would categorize as a hostile intelligence organization such as Russia's SVR or FSB, GRU. It is conceivable that he would have been assassinated purely to shut him up. That is possible, but it would have had to have been an extraordinary um, a potential breach for Russia to have done something like that would be my assessment. Whatever secrets he may have uncovered, just months later, Gareth would be dead, locked in a duffel bag. This was murder, and literally murder most foul. And bro really just trying to do his job to the fullest extent, and he even got offed for uncovering some something he wasn't supposed to, allegedly. I couldn't even do that job, that's too much. MI6 operative Gareth Williams' body discovered naked in a holdall in 2010. The obvious cause of death had to be murder, but the police were struggling to find any solid evidence to close the case. As a result, an inquest was opened to explore all the circumstances leading up to the discovery of his body and work out how he had died. The first question the inquest asked was could Gareth actually have been able to get in the bag and lock it himself? No. Peter Folding was one of two Anna? experts tasked to explore every potential way of getting into the bag and what the forensic fallout might be. Gareth was slightly taller than me, and it's just, it's, you've got to get your shoulders. I so say you've got to stand in the bath, you've got to lift yourself over, and you have to pull the bag right the way round. And I've practiced this time and time again, where your head has got to go first into the bag before you do it. It's very, very difficult. And there's lots of maneuvering just to get into this bag. It's very hot already. But if you look at my feet now, my feet are all over the bath. It's a very hot environment that day. The heating was turned up and he would have had, his body would have been perspiring, but there was no trace at all anywhere of his in this bath or around the bath. It's just not likely. I don't even think you really even had to play out the scenario. It's just, it doesn't seem likely. How would he have locked it? When I visited the flat, the information I was given, there was various traces left around the flat. There was none around the bath, there was none on the padlock, none on the zipper, none on the shower screen, relating to Gareth Williams himself. It was very clear that Gareth did not do this himself. It would be an absolute impossibility unless you're wearing forensic gloves and a forensic suit. Gareth Williams was naked and he would have let, left traces of sweat and all sorts of marks everywhere within that bathroom. Gareth Williams could have gone into the bag, he could have zipped it closed, but you cannot do it without actually leaving a trace. And that is what this is about, it's DNA and fingerprint evidence. Right. You've got to place your hands on the bath, you've got to touch the lock, the zip, and there was none of that of Gareth's found anywhere near the area. The other experts ag agreed with me. They had a yoga expert bending himself into the bag, and I believe their conclusion was, uh, was the same as mine. How could that possibly happen? Did this point unequivocally to foul play? For some, 
the lack of proof did not necessarily equal murder. The absence of fingerprints in itself isn't proof of anything. It's just the absence of fingerprints. And I, I always wonder when, what, what, what process is occurring where you think that there has to be fingerprints. You can go to any crime scene where people live and where one of those persons in the house has been murdered and you won't necessarily find their fingerprints. And we know they live there. I've had much experience with that as well. So it's in itself is not going to make a case one way or another as to how to determine this crime scene. There are situations, particularly with DNA and fingerprints, where you simply don't find them where you expect them. It's very difficult to predict. Take, let's take DNA. DNA is perhaps more easy, more easy to explain it. You might think if you pick something up that you will always find your DNA on it. You won't always find your DNA on it. You might think if you pick something up, you will always find a fingerprint. You will not always find a fingerprint. So my take on it is that every... It's really hard for me to leave fingerprints behind. Now it might be cool. But like when I, I was uh, working in this little convenience store and they sold coffee, like you make coffee and they pots and whatever. And I used to grab them with nothing, with no like, with no glove or nothing. Just the hot coffee thing. I don't know why. So I like, for a while I had no, no, it wasn't coffee. It was soups. It was soups that you pull up out of the broiler, the self-heating thing. And I used to could grab them without no issue. Cause like, I don't really feel like it don't hurt to me. So like, I like burnt my fingertips off. And I remember this because I had got, a, I got, got something that happened and I got uh, arrested. And they was trying to fingerprint me. I <laughs> couldn't fingerprint me. They said, you know what? Forget it. <laughs> Contact does not leave a trace. It, you, and to, to go down that way of thinking is a distraction in a case where there are where there is other important information available. The inquest was shown videos of the inside of Gareth's flat. Such was the public's interest in the story. These clips were published online by a reputable newspaper. The inquest now focused on why Gareth might have put himself in the hold all. Claustrophilia is the love of enclosed spaces. Sometimes it has a sexual element to it, whereby people that find themselves in confined spaces get sexually aroused. Sometimes, in fact, they need to be very constrained in, in terms of their space to feel that they can reach sexual release. Every year... Never heard of that. We get a number of cases where people have accidentally killed themselves while engaging in some kind of auto-erotic activity. And wow. we know that many times they didn't really mean to mean to harm themselves. The freaky deaths. That's crazy. That is that is beyond me. But this seemed this a sort of slightly up. strange because of the details of it really. You know, why why bother to get into the into the bag in the bath? There are some really odd aspects about this. At the inquest, Gareth's sister insisted that he was meticulous about assessing risk. There was no way he would have put himself in danger of suffocation without a backup plan. If this was something to do with erotic auto-asphyxiation, it seems very unlikely to me that he would have put himself in such a precarious situation that he didn't have an escape route right. from the inside. Because of his professional training, because of his skill set, uh, Gareth Williams understood about risk. Crypto, salute. Welcome back. They just like a 12 sub in a row. That's tough. <laughs> and if this had row. been a mad autoerotic, adventure he would have taken a pen knife or, or something like that with him as he got into the bag none of that was there gareth's flat was meticulously clean however forensics found his semen on the bathroom floor likely to have been left there shortly before his death did that mean that any sex act had actually concluded before getting in the bag if it's a solo sexual game if it is erotic asphyxiation 
bro, this is so many layers to it. Like, what is... Okay. The release, and therefore the semen, would be found inside the bag. Most certainly not outside the bag. It seemed there were multiple arguments against the solo sex act theory, but they were far from conclusive. The coroner also said he wouldn't have gotten the bag of his own because he was risk averse. I don't accept that either because I think risk is often associated with sexual excitement. When we talk about autoerotic deaths, these are extremely unusual things. Generally, you need to be aware that the, 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 the range of things that can excite people sexually is, is enormous. It's kaleidoscopic. Autoerotic events are not necessarily things that lead to ejaculation. They are just things that give an intense feeling of sexual excitement. But how did his alleged sexual fantasies fit in with his high pressure role at the most secretive workplace in Britain? His whole life was about not being able to share with his close group of family and friends what he really did. Control, control, control. It may have been that in his personal life, what he really craved was having the ability to be completely out of control, in a way to balance his in, inner world with his outer world, his external life with his inner truth. So something about being confined spaces that, that made him feel that he could relax into it because you've got nowhere else to go. You're safe. The inquest had heard that it would have been possible for Gareth to get in the bag on his own, although there were conflicting arguments about fingerprints and DNA evidence. It was also possible that he had a sexual or other motivation for getting in the bag. But those close to Gareth said he would always have had a safety backup plan. I don't think that's it either, man. Y'all trying to paint this picture crazy. That, that, that ain't it. In my... I don't think so. Where risk was involved, and this behavior was entirely out of character. But then a of witness came forward with Family some startling would, know. new evidence. In a statement read out at today's inquest, his landlady described one night back in 2007 when she and her husband heard a cry for help at half past one in the morning. Huh? Jennifer and Brian Elliott found him dressed just in shorts, lying on his back with both hands tied to his bedposts. Okay, wait. See, now that just threw a fork in it. Like, now maybe, you know what I'm saying? But in the duffel bag, in the, over, in the XXL duffel bag, with the lock on it though, how? Explain the lock. And I'm not saying that bro couldn't have got in the bag and all of this could have occurred. I'm saying how did he have locked the bag? Or am I, or is that, or am I, or is that just a minor detail that I shouldn't even be that much concentrated on? Because the way they saying that he would have to stuff himself in this bag, like do you think he could maneuver around and and somehow grab the lock from the outside and lock it and do all this extra stuff? I don't think so. MI6 spy Gareth Williams was found dead in a bag, locked from the outside. Mysteriously, there were no fingerprints on the scene, baffling investigators. The inquest into his death had become focused on two main areas. Was it somehow linked to his job with the Secret Service? Or was it a sex act gone wrong? The sex game theory would suggest Gareth had a fetish for erotic asphyxiation, an idea which was roundly dismissed by close friends and family. But then, a witness came forward with an extraordinary story. He was, by all accounts, a polite and friendly tenant, occupying the annex of this house. In a statement read out at today's inquest, his landlady described one night back in 2007 when she and her husband heard a cry for help at half past one in the morning. Jennifer and Brian Elliott found him dressed just in shorts, lying on his back with both hands tied to his bedposts. Suddenly, the erotic fetish theory had gained pace. Right. But was this witness testimony enough to conclude that Gareth had died accidentally after entering the bag to fulfill his sexual desires? The assumption that being found tied up and having to call for help 
to his landlady, escalating into him being found inside a bag locked up, like is perhaps parallel to the assumption that if you take weed, you'll end up on heroin. I don't think it necessarily follows that everybody that's into bondage will, will escalate their fetish into something much more extreme. So again, you know, I'm, I'm doubtful that the connection is absolutely clear cut. In terms of him being found in that situation of, of having to call for help, one thing is true. He knew that he needed to call out for help, and he did. So he had an escape route. I wonder how old this lady is. Not like no disrespect, but she look she looks nice for her age. You know what I'm saying? Embarrassing as it may have been. Then, another clue emerged about Gareth's is that he needed to call out for help. Okay, he called out, and for he help. did. Okay. So he had an escape route. Embarrassing as it may have been. Then, another clue emerged about Gareth's sexual interests. He had previously used one of his phones to search for bondage websites. Was this further proof? that this was indeed a sex game gone wrong. The evidence that- So not even your search history is, is cool when you pass away. We used Gotta to- be careful out here, people. To form the view that this was an autoerotic death was weak. The, the, there wasn't a great deal of evidence. The evidence that he was tied to the bed in Cheltenham was quite weak. But when you combine that with the fact that there's no evidence that anyone else was in the flat, and the belief, albeit an extraordinary thing to do, that it, that it could be that he could have got in this bag on his own, then it, it, it does start to make sense in a, as a kind of circumstantial explanation of events. The police could find no evidence of a sexual partner in the flat in the hours leading up to his death, nor was there any hard evidence of his sexuality. But one curious detail came to light when searching for clues. A wardrobe full of women's clothing. They were all bought by him. There were a considerable sum of money, thousands of pounds spent on women's clothing. But we've never established why he bought it. Some of them were still wrapped. I remember all wrapped in their tissue and clearly unused. This oh, had expensive taste. Yeah, Jimmy True. Suggestion that he may have been buying them for friends well maybe but they weren't given away if he had bought them for friends they were still in his flat you know a considerable amount of them so one's unsure he had gone on a fashion course they may have been purchased as part of that course um i don't know but is it is it relevant to his death probably not because he, as he's the coroner identified, well, we all identified, he wasn't dressed in any women's clothing at the time of his death. He was nude. It later transpired that Gareth had attended an evening class in dress design and was fascinated by fashion. A friend explained that the wigs were for a fancy dress party they were supposed to be attending together. The sex act theory seemed to be losing momentum and other clues started pointing to a much more harrowing explanation of events. Gareth's death took place on a warm summer evening in August. So why was the heating turned up to the highest setting? Right. The high temperature in his flat resulted in the fast decomposition of the body, compromising the forensics. The heating was on. Oh, it was a calculated thing. It was like chest. Somebody was thinking ahead. It plainly contributed to the decomposition of the body. Some people have speculated that was put on deliberately. And when a body decomposes, the soft tissues go first and injuries can be more difficult or even impossible to identify. This was one of the problems with being definitive about the cause of death. They can say that he died of, uh, essentially of suffocation, but they can't say, for example, whether he had been punched or attacked or anything like that, because you couldn't see any signs of this on the skin. I wasn't sure what to make of that. I, I, it does seem a bit odd, but it, I, the, there's no way I can find, I can make any sense of that in a, in a forensic review. You're making the assumption, of course, that somehow this delay was deliberate, purposeful, and an intention 
to ensure total decomposition, the heating's up, by whom? That, that starts to presuppose that someone else in the workplace is involved, and I, there's simply no evidence for that whatsoever. According to y'all, there's no evidence for any, anything. That's why this is unsolved, though, so. But there was another detail in the handling of the case, this time by MI6, that caused concern. It took a week for Gareth to be reported missing by the agency. How That's not protocol, is it? How was that possible for a working spy? Right. In MI6, it took you a week to report him? See, I ain't even click, that ain't even click for me. Why it takes so long? The coroner, uh, Fiona Wilcox, picked up on the quite surprising delay uh, before MI6 actually discovered Gareth's body in his flat, a delay of over a week. MI6 officers were summoned to the inquest to explain how this could have happened. Right, isn't there like, gotta be some type of like daily check-ins or something, at least every two days, right? You gotta check in and make things, you know what I'm saying? You gotta check in to your handler, if that's what they would say in the movies. Among three intelligence officers who gave evidence anonymously was witness G, Gareth Williams' line manager at MI6. He was asked to explain why it took a week to report the spy's absence after he had failed to turn up for work and for meetings. Right. With hindsight, he accepted he should have raised the alarm much sooner. They found no- And y'all was okay with that explanation. Oh, I should have, I should have, but you know, as an MI6 line manager, that's what you, okay. No link between his work and his death and offered nothing that could take the inquiry forward. It just wasn't adding up that MI6, who deal with national security at the highest level, would not notice Gareth's absence for so long. He'd been due to attend three meetings that week, but no concerns had been raised, and none of the usual protocols for absent staff were followed. It took a phone call. It's getting real sketchy now. It's getting real sketchy. I'm, I'm wondering. Call from his sister to raise any concern. The no-show for a week is Crazy. an odd one. Just simply not turning up, the alarm bells should have been ringing to the extent that day one of him not turning up, calls should have been made. Right. Um, there is a series of, of uh, protocols that, that, that followed through in, in that instance, so it's very surprising Nothing happened um, for a full week unless it was a complete lapse. Adding further intrigue, there was a significant time lag between the phone call to GCHQ and the subsequent call to the police. We know that Gareth's sister, Kerry, contacted the security services on the 23rd of August at 11.30 in the morning to express concern that he'd gone missing, apparently. But the police were not told about this matter until five hours later at 4.30. And what about the phone call itself? Why wouldn't MI6 attend the address, a five-minute walk from their office? Why call 999? Emergency service. I wanted to report one of our members, staff, who lives and works in London as missing. This just sounds very odd, though. GCHU obviously has a hotline to the, that you do not need to call 999. So I do not understand what that phone call was. Um, and if it was a, an. It's looking real inside now. Even if the two little things that they mentioned, the timeline of how long it took for a week when there's protocol set up, and then they called 999 instead of the hotline. Like, come on now. What, what are we hiding here? Like, what? call from GCHQ to the police and if it was a, an official call from GCHQ to the police there's better ways of de dealing with it than 999 um, I'm surprised by that level of detail to be honest hey, you could have called somebody directly as criticism of MI6 mounted a further issue was introduced nine memory sticks belonging to Gareth were found at his office they could have provided important information but were not handed over to the police, nor their content revealed. Their existence only emerged during the last day of the hearing. 
taking any form of electrical equipment in and out of the lights of MI6 headquarters. That is extremely difficult. You can't just take memory sticks into MI6 or MI5 or GCHQ. You can't take mobile phone, anything electronic. And the most sophisticated sensors that exist are operative in those places to pick up anything. Right. It was a sacking offence. If Gareth Williams had taken those memory sticks into MI6 and they had been discovered, he would have been dismissed immediately. So the fact that memory sticks were in his locker in MI6 suggests to me that he was authorised to have them there. This raises questions about what level of work Gareth was involved in. Were these memory sticks sanctioned? Or had he smuggled them in for his own personal reasons? How would, Although he, if how would Gareth have struggled, smuggled them in? They were deemed suspicious, either by MI6 or GCHQ, then that obviously puts doubt in, in uh, the fact that they could have been for work purposes. If, therefore, they belong to Gareth on a personal level, then that would beg various questions. Why on earth would he have been stupid enough to bring them into one of the most secure, top-secret buildings on the planet. If he was doing it for covert espionage reasons, in other words, he was looking to nick secrets, that would have been very high risk, but it is possible. If that was the case, he would have intended to have obviously removed them at the first opportunity, um, but again, um, if I'd have been Gareth doing something as untoward as that, I'd have taken them in, and then upon leaving work, I'd have taken them out. I would <coughs> not have left them that in right. situ. But what kind of secrets or compromising information could have been stored on these memory sticks? It could have been stuff which was not related in any way to what you were doing, uh, it's not related to his death in any way, and which was sensitive material which MI6 didn't want to get out. It could have been that. It could have been GCHQ files. It may, may have been... In could have been anything. In that sense, innocent. However, if that's the case, why didn't they declare what was there, at least in terms of generalities? They could have said to the police, we've got nine memory sticks, they contain sensitive information, but here are the broad topics which are covered. The disclosure of the memory sticks so late in the hearing left the impression that MI6 were less than eager to help. Indeed, the coroner said, it remained a legitimate line of inquiry that the secret services were involved in Gareth's death. The interesting question is why MI6 appeared to be so willing to impede a police investigation to prevent the real facts about this matter from coming out. And you have to conclude that there were security reasons why that should be the case. Gareth's sexual behaviour became the story not the highly secretive work he was involved in. This way of deflecting public interest away from the truth. Definitely a smear campaign there. Hey, I'm doing this over here, look at this. But this is really happening right here. <laughs> it's familiar territory for the Secret Service. So it's not really conceivable that Gareth Williams was effectively Common sacrificed uh, in reputational terms because it was needed to be necessary for the national interest to be carried out. That's unfortunate, but, I mean, there is a history of that sort of thing occurring in our country. Stephen Milligan, the former Conservative MP who was investigating uh, arms to Iraq, who was found dead in a sexually compromising position, wearing suspenders and stockings, and with an orange in his mouth. And, of course, that was a story which then became the news, rather than what he was investigating as an MP about dodgy arms deals. There's also questions of how the press found that out. They weren't there in this kitchen, were they? They were told by the police about this in order to generate that story. Then there's Jonathan Moyle, the defence journalist based in Santiago, who was found stuffed into a hotel cupboard uh, in a way that implied some sort of sexual deviancy. But the reality is that Jonathan Moyle had discovered the sale of 50 helicopters at a very sensitive time to Saddam Hussein. Subsequently, the Chilean authorities concluded he'd been murdered, and that was endorsed by a British coroner. I imagine that the family will have been distraught. And then when he is smeared, totally inappropriately and disgracefully, probably by his own employers, then that becomes a matter of uh, deep regret and disgust. I suspect that 
What MI6 did not want to say was this was uh, an operational death that uh, Gareth Williams was doing something that put him in harm's way. He agreed to do it and unfortunately paid for it with his life. But the balance was between our national security and giving her the full story. And um, the decision was taken that national security should win out. And it has always... It's always going to win out, right? Every time. It's been like that in this country. But if the British Secret Service was somehow involved in or covered up Gareth's murder, the ultimate question remains, why did they do it? It's like that here too. I think what Gareth may have stumbled across is the identity of a Russian mole in GCHQ. And that would have caused them to conclude he had to be eliminated. There's no movie about this? This, this, like, honestly, this got a hunt, uh, hour and four minute documentary. This could easily be sold to Hollywood or something. Gareth Williams was found dead, locked inside a bag, aged 31. His work as an MI6 spy meant the case had become headline news all over the world. But was it murder? or self-inflicted. The coroner suspected foul play, but with insufficient evidence, could only give a narrative verdict. I've always been satisfied that a third party may have been involved in his death, and the coroner has confirmed that in her finding today. The news headlines were quick to run salacious stories about Gareth's private life. Thousands of column inches were devoted to his interest in bondage and women's clothing. But could it have been that these very secrets were discovered by Russian security forces and used as leverage for blackmail? 50 years ago when I was a student, if you were a homosexual, you could not work for a secret yeah. British agency because you laid yourself open to blackmail. Well, there's a very simple answer to that, which is to tell people, for the people to accept, that that's fine, that's how you want to live your life. As long as it doesn't get in the way of your professional duties, that's fine. And if you tell them at a stroke, you remove the blackmail threat. And I don't think getting uh, kicks by tying yourself up in, in bed. He, I feel like he made it simpler than it, than it really was. And it really is for, for people that prefer that lifestyle, you know what I'm saying? prefer that walk of life. I'm almost sure it's a mental block. Like, they gotta admit to their family and, and it's a lot going on with that probably. Would put you in a position where you were being blackmailed. For MI6 officers, we are briefed about the potential of uh, hostile agencies, particularly uh, the more sophisticated hostile agencies, uh, such as one belonging to the Russians, approaching us as officers and putting something um, compromising in front of us. The rule of thumb with that, the organization MI6's attitude was it was, um, if that happens, um, if you're approached, look them in the eye and say, publish and be damned, and then come back and be honest with us, MI6. That is the approach taken. Be defined. Um, do not allow a hostile agency to get its hooks into you through blackmail. So I would anticipate that Gareth Williams would have, in fact, been quite open with MI6 about his preferences. However, the Russians may not have known that, and of course the Russians do specialise in compromise when they secure information about someone's uh, personal activities and try to use that as blackmail. It's a technique going back decades, which the Russians are very keen on. Despite a thorough police investigation and an inquest that had examined all the events leading up to the discovery of his body in forensic detail, his death remained a mystery. Speculation continued that Russian forces were somehow involved, but no definitive link had been found. Then something extraordinary happened. A former major in the KGB came forward with some startling information. Boris Kovachev 
was someone who was in touch with me, who I think was also fearful for his own position in this country, given the number of suspicious deaths of Russians which had been occurring. And he believes he knows what happened from his contacts, which he still maintains within the Russian state and the Russian security services. Karpichkov explained that Gareth had been identified as a person of interest to the Russian Secret Service. They were aware of his sexual interests and were trying to blackmail him into working for them. I think what Gareth may have stumbled across is the identity of a Russian mole in GCHQ, and I believe he would have told his MI6 handlers about that matter, uh, and they would have been fully in the picture. That being the case, the Russians would have concluded, perhaps, that Gareth Williams had to be disposed of in order to protect their source within GCHQ Cheltenham. That would give a reason for his disposal. But not everyone agreed with this new in. Bro, the government and all of this spy stuff, it's so toxic. It's so toxic in that world. Look at this. Like, this is like a whole, like, I, this is video game storylines that don't even, like, like people like me wouldn't even believe that this is going on unless I was watching it with my eyes right here. This is crazy. This is literal stuff you see in the movies. But, you know, I feel like the movies is always, like, based on some level of realness. Uh, but this is, this is crazy. Keep going. Tell. That article appears in a newspaper almost unattributable there's no further source to it and it's printed and then that becomes an alleged truth and i don't, don't understand that at all the whole story is fantastic but it doesn't come with evidence it doesn't come with witness statements it doesn't come with any subsequent inquiry from the police or the security services it's a story which is published just this side of anonymous faceless certainly and what does one do with that? Where, where does that come from? If someone knows that much information, how come it's not then subject to full scrutiny and a resolution? Talk about speculation. Sam, Hamish. That speculation. Listen, Hamish. If that is the case, if this is, if this is, I know this story has no proof, no witnesses. It's just speculation, it's hearsay. But you think, the M by six wants anybody to know that they got a mole in there. You think they want this information out, or do you think they want it to be handled in clo behind closed doors? You know what I'm saying? Upon speculation, we wouldn't know. Uh, people we like would made it, we would be we. It wouldn't be made to look like, oh, it's just a tabloid story. It's hearsay. Man, nobody don't believe that. Like, that's how it would be made to look. always going to be look. very wary of defector evidence. Defector evidence is very important, but it can be motivated. Some Russian may well have made an approach to Gareth Williams. Gareth Williams immediately went to see his line manager in MI6 and said, what shall I do? And it was talked about, probably talked about at the highest level. And they said, yeah, but go, go with it. Find out where this is leading. What do they want? And maybe to see an opportunity for a counterintelligence move against the people who had recruited him and that their discovery that actually he was spinning them along meant that he had to be killed. And so they killed him, and they killed him in such a way as to ensure that their own fingerprints were nowhere to be found. And it was a professional job. That sounds job. There's no, no, no question about it. Inconceivable. It was not a professional job. If you rule out suicide, then it was murder. And it was murder by people who knew exactly how to do it without leaving a trace. And not a I trace. think that's much more plausible than to state the existence of an uh, unknown Russian agent in GCHQ. I think that is very Im implausible. If we accept that Gareth may have been killed by his dangerous and secretive work with MI6, why then did it take them so long to find him? Man, it could be either one of those in my book. His body. I think uh, they deliberately 
kept information about his death secret, didn't look for it, didn't look for the bag as it were, until he had to. MI6 operative Gareth Williams had been found dead, locked inside a sports bag in the bathroom of his London flat. Three years on from his death, and following a police investigation and an inquest, his death remained a mystery. Unsolved. But a former KGB major had recently come forward with a plausible explanation of what had happened to Gareth. It might also explain why MI6 had taken so long to discover his body. I think the reason was that those at MI6 were aware that, that Gareth had identified a particular mole in uh, GCHQ and they wanted time to find that person and deal with them. And had they gone public immediately with knowledge of his death, then that would have alerted that person down in Cheltenham and the email of Scarford. So I think uh, they deliberately kept information about his death secret, didn't look for it, didn't look for the bag as it were, until they had to. MI6 and MI5 and indeed GCHQ will never provide details of operations, current operations that they are involved in. And right. the decision was taken that national security should win out. The mystery and debate around Gareth's death has been raging to this very day. With a lack of evidence, but no lack of theories of murder motives and foreign involvement, leading experts are still bitterly divided as to what really happened to the body in the bag. I don't know, at this point I really can't say, all you can say is which theory you agree with. There's two that I could agree with, and the last two that we just went over, they found out who he was, he, they told them to go along with it, his handler told him to go along with it, they figured it out that he was just trying to spin it, and they outed him, they took him out. That's the one that I, 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 I'm going with, personally. What do I think happened to Gareth Williams? Talk to us, uh, Hamish. Well, I mean, my, my personal view was it was not homicide, it wasn't murder. I didn't believe the view that a man or women or other men from whichever nation state is alleged, whether it be the Russians or whatever, I didn't subscribe to that at all, that they had come to his premises, clearly not forced entry, gained entry, therefore presumably with permission, and that then they somehow forced him to strip naked, placed him in a bag, and left him there for dead. I've never understood how that could be the case. And I think Gareth Williams' profession, his high intelligence, his constant risk assessment of his role and work in what he did would never have allowed that to happen. So you don't believe that it was an M. You think he did this to himself? Because there's only two options, right? If it ain't an M, then he did it to himself. Okay, listen, man. I'm thinking a little bit more. Here's my theory now. You ready? He was... He was. It, it, now, there was an insider. There was an insider. But the insider was sent to get close to somebody. You know what I'm saying? The Russian spy was sent to get close to somebody and they did their background work and they find out he liked kinky stuff, freaky stuff. Now, I don't know if they mentioned... Well, they did say he was a cross-dresser, allegedly. This is how my brain is working. They sent this agent. He developed a close personal you know, relationship, romantic relationship, and then he figured it out. Gareth figured it out. And then he went to go report it. And then he, they was like, well, keep playing along with it. And see what's going on. And then the other guy, you know, he was still close with him. He was acting clueless. But he had also figured it out. The Russian guy. And that's why he was in his house. No forced entry. Nude. I'm just waffling. I don't know it. <laughs> there is no evidence that anyone else was in that flat 
other than his sister and two employees of MI6. So there is no direct evidence of criminality in that flat. If you believe he couldn't get into the bag on his own, then plainly you are compelled to believe that a third party was involved. But that's not the conclusion I reached on the basis of the evidence I reviewed. What I would find extremely difficult to believe is that, for example, a Russian, highly trained team of assassins decided this was the way they were going to kill him. It's a very clumsy way to kill somebody. And it ain't that clumsy. Y'all ain't figured out who did it. it you know what I'm saying? Of course, there's no guarantees. He could potentially have got out of that bag. Somebody could have found him, rescued him. If you're going to do an assassination, the one thing you need to be absolutely clear about is that there's going to be a death at the end of it. And this, um, this way of dying, there could have been a better outcome. He could have survived. So my view on his death remains that either this was um, a sex game that went wrong or it was related activities such as suicide or other activity that used oh sex kit God. that was in situ within his apartment. I do not I tend to agree with the coroner, Fiona Wilcox, who concluded this was an unlawful killing. That was also the view of the in investigating police officer, DCI Jackie Sabia. An escapologist tried, I think, 300 times to lock himself into the bag in, in the manner in which uh, Gareth Williams was found and found he couldn't do it. You then have a situation where there were no fingerprints from Gareth Williams found on the bag, uh, on the bath in which the bag was found, on the padlock or anywhere else. Therefore, in my view, for the police to then subsequently three years on conclude it wasn't... I feel like if you believe that he locked himself in this bag, you're a delusional. Uh, ...unlawful but some sort of suicide, uh, I'm afraid smacks of a cover-up. I suspect that what was responsible for his death was the work that he was doing for MI6. I also suspect that work almost certainly involved developing some kind of a technical relationship, personal technical relationship, with a hostile intelligence service. And increasingly, since 2014, I believe, come to believe, that hostile intelligence agency was Russian in origin. And I think that his death was arranged and executed by agents, officers of the Russian government. <coughs> I can agree with that. That sounds He didn't deserve legitimate. to die in the course of his duty. He certainly didn't. He did not deserve to die in the course of his duty. He did not deserve to die and get at, and then 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 all the headlines be turned into his personal life. That's crazy. Deserve to be rubbished exactly. and to be smeared in a way that subsequently happened. It's important to remember that the secretive world of MI6 means we don't know what Gareth was or was not involved in or what level he was operating at. However. The head of MI6, Sir John Soares, certainly did. He made a point of attending Gareth's funeral, praising his enormous talent and his valuable contribution to our national security. Maybe Sir John... He looked like he got some secrets. On the source is turning up at the funeral Crazy. is, in a sense, giving him a posthumous medal. The balance of evidence suggests that Gareth Williams should be remembered as a hero who was killed in the, the line of course duty. of operations and by enemy action. Gareth Williams was being smeared constantly as a transvestite cross-dresser by all the reports coming out in various newspapers. Gareth Williams served his country and he should have been honoured. I mean, these people protect our country. They work behind the scenes in the dark, murky world protecting us. But he, he should have been seen as a hero. Twelve True. years after the MI6 agent was found dead, there have been calls for a forensic case review. 
all the time we are learning more and more about how to examine these old challenging cases in more innovative ways. So there are lots of reasons why it would be a very good idea, I think, to do a proper review of this case, a forensic review, and see what else could be done. It is terrible. It must be terrible for Gareth family. Oh, man. Oh. It feels like it could well be a miscarriage of, of justice. There is no conclusion at the moment. The coroner... So where's the editor, man? Y'all ain't find it in 12. Y'all shouldn't even reopen that. You know what I'm saying? ...says one thing, as I understand it, and the... Police reopen those wounds for the family. He's saying another, and it's not a good state of affairs. In such a public death, Gareth's life was thrown under the microscope, and his true character lost in theories and supposition. It's good to remember who he was and what he meant to those who loved him. At the inquest, his sister said some beautiful words about Gareth. Talk to us. She said, in terms of a big brother figure, Gareth was perfect. It is impossible to do justice to Gareth's impressive character without meeting him. The understanding is his family really knew him and by the sounds of things really accepted him for who he was, exactly as he was. That's very precious. Should we all be so lucky to be fully accepted by our families? That's it, man. This is very interesting. I'm still don't even. I don't even know what my theory is. I don't have a theory, but I agree with the buddy that just the last dude who was struggling and his button up, barely could breathe. I believe what he believed. TLO, leave a like, comment. I'm done.